ولا تعجل بالقرآن من قبل أن يقضى إليك وحيه وقل رب زدني علما إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد So carrying on then with the three fundamental principles we got to the section now ودليل الصلاة because previously we've been talking about the shahadatain the first part of the shahada and the second part of the shahada the testification that there is none worthy of worship in truth except Allah and the different meanings and explanations you need to understand of that and then we did the testification that I testify Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah and the four points that we spoke about regarding that what were those four points then the first one was to obey the messenger in what he commanded us what was the second one to believe him in what he informed us the third one to stay away from what he prohibited us and the fourth one to only worship Allah in the manner that he prescribed to us today then we move on and it's the uh, statement of the sheikh the author ودليل الصلاة والزكاة وتفسير التوحيد قوله تعالى وما أمروا إلا ليعبدوا الله مخلصين له الدين حنفاء ويقيموا الصلاة ويؤتوا الزكاة وذلك دين القيمة that the evidence for the prayer and the zakat and an explanation of Tawheed itself is in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاء That they were not commanded except to worship Allah sincerely to worship Allah upon ikhlas upon Tawheed حُنَفَاء meaning upon Tawheed وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُ الزَّكَاةَ and to establish the prayer and to give the zakat here then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the ayah three points are being mentioned there one is the point of worshipping Allah purely and sincerely upon Tawheed the basis of the religion. The second point is, وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ That we establish the prayer and take note of that word in the ayah. وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ And that they establish the prayer. That is different to just saying that they pray. Just praying is one thing. Establishing the prayer is another thing. In the ayah, it doesn't just say that they pray. It says they establish the prayer. So what is the difference between just praying and establishing the prayer? Establishing the prayer basically means Praying properly in accordance to the sunnah. So you fulfill all of the pillars of the prayer, the obligations of the prayer. You fulfill the conditions of the prayer, the times of the prayer. You establish the prayer, meaning you do it properly in accordance to the sunnah. That is different to just saying pray. Somebody may just pray. But are they praying properly according to the sunnah? Are they establishing all of the pillars and the obligations? Are they establishing all of the conditions? Who knows? Many people, they have errors. 
in how they pray. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as though or as you have seen me pray. Pray as you have seen me pray. So here it says they establish the prayer. Meaning with its conditions and the pillars and the obligations and the times etc. All of it properly in accordance to the sunnah. That is the meaning of establishing the prayer. As opposed to somebody just praying and maybe they are missing all of the the various parts of the sunnah regarding that prayer. They are just praying. They are not properly establishing the prayer in accordance to the sunnah. So here it tells us to establish the prayer. وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ And when it comes to the prayer, we know that the prayer is the second highest pillar of Islam. After the shahadatain, after the shahadatain, the highest pillar in Islam is the prayer. We know that the prayer was established upon us on the night of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, the night of ascension, when the Prophet ﷺ was taken up to the heavens. And on that night, Allah commanded him with the prayer and the hadith, we've mentioned it before, how initially it was obligated as 50 prayers. And then when the Prophet ﷺ was returning, he came across Musa alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam said to him I have experienced my people before you and I know that your people will not burden 50 prayers in a day so go back and ask Allah to give you some reduction so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam returns and it is reduced by 10 but then when he's coming back, Musa alayhi salam tells him again, your ummah will not be able to do it. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi asks for reduction again. It's reduced again. And then he asks again, it's reduced again. All of the time he continues to come back and forward between Musa alayhi salam and Allah until it is reduced to five prayers in the day. And that is what it remained upon. Because when the Prophet ﷺ was returning and he told Musa ﷺ it has been established as five prayers, Musa ﷺ mentioned to him still, still your ummah may not be able to burden that, go and ask for reduction. But the Prophet ﷺ said, I have gone back and asked for reduction so much that I am now shy in front of my Lord to ask any more reduction and I am going to be content upon that. So it was established as five prayers in the day, but the reward of them is like the 50 prayers because every action is multiplied by tenfold. Every action, every hasana bi ashri amthaliha, every good deed by tenfold example. So every prayer, is 10 rewards and five prayers 50 so even though you're praying just one or uh, praying just five prayers the reward is like that of the 50 prayers so it was established on that night the scholars they say that in of itself shows you the great virtue of the prayer because normally how did the revelation come to the Prophet ﷺ? The commandments, the sunnah, how did it normally come? Jibreel would bring it down to the Prophet ﷺ. But on this occasion with the prayer, Jibreel ﷺ did not bring that commandment down to the earth to the Prophet to tell him. Instead, the Prophet was taken up to the heavens to be given that ruling, which shows the great virtue of this act of worship, the great virtue of it. 
Similarly, a Sheikh al said, this act of worship, the prayer, it is an act of worship that is beloved to Allah. And one of the evidences for that is that initially Allah declared it as 50 prayers in the day. And if you were to pray 50 prayers in the day, then it would take up hours and hours of your day, maybe half of your day or more, praying 50 times a day. So it shows that it's a beloved act of worship to Allah, that it was initially 50, but then reduced to five with the reward of the 50. So that is the prayer. Also, it's mentioned that on the day of judgment, the first thing that you will be asked about is the prayer. The first thing that a person is asked about on the day of judgment is your prayer. And then the hadith it continues that if your prayer is good and intact, then the rest of your worships will be good and intact. But if your prayer is missing, then what about the rest of your worship? That's also going to be missing. That's also going to be deficient. But it is mentioned in a narration how if you have some deficiencies, but you used to pray the supererogatory prayers, that they can then fill some of your deficiencies in the prayer too. So it's the first thing that a person will be asked about on the day of judgment, the prayer. The prayer is also something that some of the Salaf, they said, if a person abandons it, then he is a kafir. Some of the scholars, they hold the opinion that Tariq salah Amdan is a kafir, that the person who leaves the prayer out of laziness on purpose, he leaves the prayer, then he's a kafir. And they quote some of the narrations from the Prophet sallallahu That the, the covenant between us and them is that prayer. That is the difference between the believers and the non-believers. And whomsoever abandons that prayer, then he has committed kufr. And in one narration, he has committed shirk. The one who abandons the prayer. So it is something severe. The affair of the prayer. Something severe that a person must take into consideration and take heed of. When Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was stabbed, when he was leading the Fajr prayer, and he was stabbed by Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, stabbed him with a double-sided dagger, and made multiple wounds in him. Some of those wounds were so big, that when he was drinking milk afterwards, because he didn't die instantly, he survived and then died later. But the wounds were there. And when he was drinking milk, the milk would come out of the wound straight. Such was the severity of some of those wounds in his intestines and stomach, etc. That he would drink the milk and it would come straight out of those wounds. But it's mentioned how they said to Umar ibn al-Khattab regarding the Fajr prayer. The next day, it's mentioned how they mentioned to him the Fajr prayer and he said, absolutely, because the one who has no prayer, then he has no share in Islam. So even in that state of injury, even in that state of that much stabbing and the wounds, he says, absolutely, we must pray to stand and to pray even in that state. Such is the affair of the prayer. You even have Salatul Khawf. And if you are in the battlefield, you still pray. There are different rulings as to how you pray, but you still pray even then. So the prayer is not something which can be abandoned ever. As long as you have your senses, then you must pray. Even if you are paralyzed, you're lying down on a bed, then you still pray with your head. Pray, make that intention and pray. 
If you are completely paralyzed, some of the scholars say even pray with your eyes. So the prayer is not something that can be uh, excused. A person prays. And that's why as well in the narrations when the Prophet Sallallahu used to send the companions, he used to tell them to teach the people about Tawheed and then straight after that, to teach them about the prayer. In the hadith of Mu'adh, after the Prophet wasallam told him to begin with Tawheed, he said to him, فَإِنْهُمْ قَبِلُوا ذَلِكَ مِنْكَ يعني قَبِلُوا التَّوْحِيدَ مِنْكَ الشَّهَادَتَيْنَ ثُمَّ أَخْبِرْهُمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ That if they accept Tawheed, then tell them Allah has obligated upon them five prayers in every day and night. So certainly this affair of the prayer is a great affair. And a person cannot ever abandon or become lazy with the prayers. Then also as zakat is mentioned here, as zakat that is due when a person has the relevant amount of money or wealth, of the different types of wealth, when you have the relevant amount, the minimum quantity, the nisab, then you've had it for a year, then the zakat is obligated upon you. And many people, they may be slack when it comes to the zakat. And you have to be aware, this is another great pillar of Islam. It is the right of the people that you give the zakat, the right of the poor and those in need, you cannot hold back that money. Zakat for the one where the nisab is reached and the year has passed. It is an obligation that you must fulfill once every year. So the zakat is mentioned here also. Then after that, وَدَلِيلُ الصَّيَامِ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى And the evidence for fasting is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصَّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That all you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you, just as it was prescribed upon those who came before you, so that you may achieve taqwa, so that you may achieve piety. So notice in this ayah, the ayah that is the evidence for fasting, the pillar of Islam of fasting, the obligatory fasting once a year in the month of Ramadan. Notice in the ayah, Allah tells us that this action of fasting, this act of worship is something that was established not just on this ummah, but the nations that went before us too. The other umm, the other nations that went before us, fasting was upon them too. Because it mentions, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Fasting is obligated upon you just as it was. Just as it was prescribed upon those who came before you, before the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they used to fast, and this indicates again that fasting is an act of worship beloved to Allah. That it was prescribed upon the nations that came before the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam too. So that is the fourth pillar mentioned here. And then the fifth pillar, وَدَلِيلُ الْحَجِّ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ That indeed for Allah upon the people is for them to make the hajj to the house the Hajj of the House of Allah, Al-Ka'bah, 
man istata'a ilayhi sabila for the one who is able has the ability to go upon that path and to perform hajj meaning the one who has the physical ability and health the one who has the wealth you have those conditions in place you have that ability in place and for the woman she has a mahram then upon you is to go and perform that hajj once in your lifetime and if a person performs more than one hajj then the remainder of those pilgrimages they count as extra reward as nafal as supererogatory and that's why if a person does do hajj on behalf of someone else then you have to make sure you have done your own hajj first because there is the famous narration regarding shubhruma when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam heard somebody say labbaik an shubhruma that he was making his intention to do hajj on behalf of somebody called shubhruma so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him who is this shubhruma the man said to him he's one of my brothers or one of my relatives he was doing it on behalf of somebody so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ahajajta an nafsik have you done hajj for yourself qala the man said no he hadn't even done his own hajj yet he was doing it straight away first time for this other person so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him hujja an nafsik thumma hujja an shubruma do your own hajj first then you can do the hajj on behalf of shubruma so the one in a lifetime for the one with the ability that is the obligation what if a child does hajj his first hajj at the age of 5 or 6 or 7 then does that cover them for their one in their lifetime the first time they go they do it with the intention for themselves that child he understands he's 8 years old he does the hajj makes the intention for himself is that his once in the lifetime or not done then no why not because you can only do that once in the lifetime after the age of puberty So that one will count as a general optional type of hajj for that child and there'll be reward for his parents too but then the actual hajj of the lifetime that will occur that will count after the age of puberty so these are the five pillars of Islam that he mentioned initially and that was in the level of Islam remember we were talking about the three different levels the level of Islam the level of iman and the level of ihsan <coughs> what we've just discussed so far now was the level of Islam and that Islam is built upon those five pillars the pillar of the shahadatain the pillar of the prayer the pillar of fasting the pillar of zakat and the pillar of hajj they are the five pillars of islam and what does it mean by pillars meaning the da'im the structure upon which islam is built they are the five pillars properly as pillars that islam is built upon those are the five posts that islam is built upon then we move on to the second level and you remember the circles we were talking about the biggest circle is the circle of islam when a person enters into islam they enter into the circle of islam but then after that as your iman increases and you become more practicing etc you may move up into the smaller circle of iman and that is the second level al martabatu thaniyah al iman 
the second level which is the level of Iman and this level is more specific to the general level of Islam the level of Islam is the broad general level this level of Iman now is a smaller level within that a more specific level within that المرتبة الأولى تقدم وهي الإسلام وثنى بمرتبة الإيمان وهي أعم من مرتبة الإسلام من جهة نفسها وأخص من جهة أصحابها وأهله هم خواص أهل الإسلام So the people who reach the level of Iman they are the very specifics the mu'minun who reach that higher level to the level of Iman Whereas otherwise, people are generally in the level of Islam. فَإِنَّ الْإِيمَانِ وَصْفٌ أَعْلَى مِنْ وَصْفِ الْإِسْلَامِ The description of Iman, Iman is higher than the general description of Islam. Iman is a higher level than just Islam. فَهُوَ من الأمور الباطنة الذي يؤتمن عليه ويكون خفية الإسلام من الأمور المدركة المحسوسة في الظاهر مشتق من التسليم أو المسالمة كما تقدم فإذا أطلق الإيمان في النصوص دخل فيه الإسلام وإذا أطلق الإسلام لم يدخل فيه الإيمان when you hear in the books, for example, and it mentions Iman, the Mu'minun, then that is a statement that generally incorporates the Mu'minun and, as we are saying now, the Muslimun. Because Islam is a general level and Iman is a specific one. But if in the books generally you hear Iman being mentioned <laughs> and the Mu'minun being mentioned, then it does just mean generally it includes Islam, Muslimun. It doesn't just mean the higher level Mu'minun. So if Iman is just mentioned like that broadly and openly, it incorporates Islam. When you talk about it specifically and you make a point of it, that's when we're talking about the higher level of Iman. Here, obviously, we're explaining that and making a point of it. But in books, generally, if you just hear Iman being spoken about and the Mu'minun being spoken about generally, then that incorporates Islam, all of the Muslims generally. But if Islam is being mentioned, Islam is being mentioned generally, that doesn't necessarily incorporate Iman. Because Iman is a higher level of the general Islam. So the point to take note of is that Iman is a higher level. Al-Iman al-Shari'i. What is Iman, Islamically speaking? Iman, Islamically speaking, is qawlun wa amalun. As some of the Salaf they used to mention before, Iman is statements and actions. That's what they used to say. Statements and actions. Nowadays, the scholars, they explain it with three things to make it even easier to understand. They say it is belief of the heart and then statements of the tongue and actions of the limbs. That's how it's often explained. Belief in the heart, statements of the tongue, actions of the limbs. In the olden days, in the books of Aqidah, you will often just see it as statements and actions. So where has belief of the heart gone? Because they incorporate that into statements and actions. It is the statement of the heart, which is the belief of the heart. The actions of the heart, meaning love, fear, hope. So they would incorporate belief of the heart, as we say it now, belief of the heart, statements of the tongue, actions of the limbs, the belief of the heart is incorporated into statements and actions. 
So when they said Iman is just statements and actions, and that's how you see it often in the books of Aqidah of the scholars of the past, then they are incorporating belief of the heart into that. So it's the same thing. Belief of the heart, statements of the tongue, actions of the limbs. That's exactly what they meant as well. But nowadays the scholars and the definition widely used is even easier and clearer that it is belief of the heart, statement of the tongue, action of the limb. It's all the same. Don't be confused reading the books of old that they're only saying it's statement and action and you're thinking where's the belief of the heart? They intend that within it. So what is the evidence that Iman is statements and actions? Because many of the people of innovation, they do not accept Iman is belief and statements and actions. Many of them may say it is belief and belief and statements, but a lot of them exclude actions from Iman. So what are one or two simple evidences to highlight that your actions are from Iman? That can be used as an example. We're going to come to that here in the text. Any other evidences? Evidences that Iman incorporates your actions. Take the example of the prayer. Prayer, is it an action or not? It's an action. Allah called the prayer in the Quran as Iman. Where? When the, when the Prophet when the Qibla was changed to Mecca. The ayah? وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow your iman to go to waste. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ And that is regarding the story of the Qibla direction changing. Initially they used to pray towards Bait al-Maqdis. But then afterwards it was changed towards the Kaaba. So some of the companions, they came to the Prophet wasallam, and they asked him, what about our others, the, the, uh, the other companions or the other believers who died <laughs> before the change in the Qibla came? Which means all of their prayers were only done in the old direction. They died before the new revelation came. So they came asking the Prophet وسلم, what will happen to all of their prayers? <coughs> will they still be counted? So then the ayah was revealed, Allah would not waste your iman, meaning your Prayer. prayers. Those prayers that they used to pray in the other direction, they are counted and they are given the reward because at that time that was the revelation. So the point is though, the word Iman is being used and it refers to your prayer. It refers to your prayer. And the prayer is an action. Therefore, an evidence that actions are within Iman. Other evidences you can mention are wudu, ghusl. Are they actions or not? Actions, making wudu, doing ghusl, etc. In the narration it mentions uh, purification is half of your iman purification is it a physical action or not absolutely and the hadith is telling us it's half of your iman meaning the believer is always upon purity and cleanliness and upon purification and that's from iman and purification are physical actions so there are many uh, evidences like this Many evidences like this, which indicate that your actions are from Iman. So that is what we're talking about here now, the second level, the level of Iman. 
And the author mentions here, That Iman is 70 odd levels. And in one narration it mentions 60 odd levels. The highest level of Iman is the statement La ilaha illallah, the Shahada, the Tawheed. That is the highest and the pinnacle of Iman. The statement of La ilaha illallah, because that is the statement of Tawheed. That is the statement of singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your worship. That is the highest of Iman. وَأَدْنَاهَا إِمَاطَةُ الْأَذَى عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ And the lowest level of Iman is removing some harm from the pathway. That you find some obstacle in the pathway, it could cause difficulty or harm to somebody coming along that pathway, that road, some brick or some rock or something there. So you move it out of the way. So as to remove that harm, anybody coming along afterwards will not be faced with that harm. Doing that is an act within Iman. It is an act of Iman. It's mentioned as the lowest level of Iman, that even if you do that, it's from your Iman. And doing that, is it a physical action or not? Absolutely, removing that rock from the road, it's a physical action. And so that is another proof that actions are from Iman. But that is the uh, mentioning of the lowest level of Iman. And then, وَالْحَيَاءُ شُعْبَةٌ مِنَ iman, And also, your shyness is also uh, from the levels of Iman. What does that mean that your shyness is from the levels of Iman? Meaning that you humble yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you feel shy that you should sin against Allah. You feel embarrassed and shy that you should sin against Allah. So that type of shyness is a part of Iman also. And if you have that reality of shyness before Allah, then you would not commit the sins but because of the lack of that shyness, the sins they occur. So these are mentioned as the different levels of Iman. And these levels of Iman, they incorporate, you will notice, belief, statements, and actions. Removing the harm is an action. Haya, that shyness, that's from, from the heart, from within. And the statement of La ilaha illallah is your statement. So you have from within the belief, the heart, you have the statement and you have the actions. All of them mentioned in this narration. Then he goes on to say, وَأَرْكَانُهُ sitta, And the pillars of Iman are six. The pillars of Iman are then six. But inshallah ta'ala, the pillars of Iman, the six pillars of Iman, that's where we'll start from next time.